I'm Michelle Miller from CBS Saturday Morning and welcome to The Dish. Grab your fishing gear. Today we're diving in for all things seafood from crab to squid and from coast to coast. We head to Texas where a chef combines his Vietnamese roots with Cajun fare and to Maine for one of the most delectable lobster rolls in the nation. But first, Jeff Glor meets a farmer turned restaurateur who now runs one of the most iconic oyster bars in Rhode Island. Magua, you ready? He's ready. Magua has to approve all oyster. That's right, he's the head of operations over here. <laughs> On a sun-soaked New England day, Perry Rosso took us to Potter Pond just off, but sheltered from the heaviest waves of the Atlantic. The ideal spot to harvest a food that is changing everything here, oysters. All right, right off the deck of the boat. That's an extra, gives it an extra flavor. That's Probably not the thing. cleanest thing in the world, right? <laughs> not bad. <laughs> Add that to the list. Rosso started fishing as a boy and digging little neck clams when he was 12. He graduated from the University of Rhode Island after studying aquaculture, then started a small oyster farm in 2002. So we gotta leave him space to grow. Nice. You got little shrimps jumping around in there. Rosso operates seven acres of water farming with more than 16 million oysters, plus bay scallops. Really interesting animals. They have eyes, they have 32 sets of eyes on the top and 32 sets on the bottom. Wow. And you can see them, they're like little blue specks. Russo has also built a huge nearby vegetable farm. So we have beets, salad greens, a couple varieties of kale. Over here we got our peppers and our tomatoes started. Um, and uh, salad greens over here as well as the asparagus. All of which supply his restaurants, which has become a smash hit for diners across the East Coast. Matunic Oyster Bar. You're not a chef? No. You've never been a foodie? Uh, I've become a foodie. How is the raw bar feast over here? By now though, Rosso has taken his broader message global, delivering TED Talks about the importance and sustainability of aquaculture to feed a crowded and hungrier planet. Shellfish farming is the epitome of sustainable agriculture. Aquaculture sounds like agriculture. Aquaculture is agriculture. And We're sitting here. You can sit here and look at, at, and look at where your food comes from. Just line of sight. Right. It's important. I mean, we have, uh, you know, the vegetable farm and the oyster farms all within a mile of here. To be able to see, you know, where your food is coming from, see the farmers coming in with the oysters, um, putting them right in the fridge and serving them right here. Uh, you know, it's a unique thing, and I think, you know, oyster farm geek thought is, you know, this incoming tide is delivering food to my babies out there, you know. <laughs> One of the great things about oyster farming is we don't have to feed the oysters. They eat the naturally occurring phytoplankton in the water, so this is delivering food to the animals. And it's lunch for them right now. It's lunch for them, and it's cleaning the water, so it's uh, beneficial. There are a lot of people who come in who just don't, won't eat oysters. Right. Do you make it your mission to try to convert them? Well, I, I do try to get them into oysters, and our oysters, the Matunic oysters, are uh, they're petite oysters, so they're not big, so they're a little bit more palatable for someone who might be a little wary of eating oysters. It's almost like it's like a like a gateway oyster. The, gate, the gateway oyster is what I like to call it. That's right. Rosso has built his menu slow and steady, the breadth of which we were able to sample, starting of course with oysters. So these are the Matunics right here. Are those are the ones we farm raise out in Potter Pond. I'm, I'm digging in. Yeah, try one of those. Great. What do you think? Good. Sweet. Yeah, they're crisp, they're sweet. They're... It is crisp. Yep. To accompany Rosso's best seller, we also had a Matunic special, passion fruit oysters, with salmon eggs and cucumbers soaked in sake. If you prefer your oysters cooked, there were the bourbon oysters. Also, an asparagus and tomato salad with vegetables from his farm and a local seafood salad. Calamari, oyster stew with a rosemary cream broth, and this quinoa crab dish that blew our minds. Look at this sucker. So you've got quinoa, avocado, mm -hmm. crab, mm -hmm. and drizzle over the top is... We have uh, lemon zest aioli there.
Oh, that's fantastic. It's nice. So good. Not to be overlooked, the tuna with Creole mustard and mashed potatoes and a ridiculous lobster pizza he recently debuted. It's a pizza we put on the menu during COVID. I was researching what's the most popular takeout food, pizza. Uh, and so I said I wanted to make the best seafood pizza in the world. And uh, I think we might have come close to it. We got some prosciutto, some truffle, some arugula on there. It's really delicious. It should be illegal. This is crazy. How isn't good. It? it really is. <laughs> that pizza is absurd. For dessert, there was a blueberry crumble, Animatunic's signature, key lime pops. The full scale of Rosso's creation here is amazing, even though he still feels like the little kid scrapping for clams just to make a few bucks. You talk about this a lot, about your, your fear of failure, of, of not succeeding. Uh -huh. Do you still feel that way? Yeah, yeah, absolutely. You're never satisfied. Uh, I, I don't, you know, like to think of myself as someone who's never satisfied, but the reality uh, might be that, yeah. And in the end, people get a healthier ocean because of it and, and good food. Yeah, there's definitely... So uh, we should enjoy your pain. <laughs> <laughs> Up next, crawfish in Cajun country. Chef Trong Nguyen gave up a career in the casino industry to follow his passion for food, and has paid off. He was nominated for a James Beard Award for Best Chef Texas in 2020, and his restaurant, Crawfish and Noodles, has turned into a destination for locals and tourists alike. Janet Chamlian got a taste. A walk through the busy kitchen of Chef Trong Nguyen is to find him wildly outnumbered <laughs> by crustaceans of the Gulf. Hundreds of fresh crawfish and crab fill the kitchen. But it's never enough. They always sell out at Houston's Crawfish and Noodles, a modest strip mall restaurant that has more accolades than some of the country's finest dining spots, including the most coveted of all, a James Beard nomination for Best Chef Texas in 2020. Quite a payoff for a guy who spent 30 years in the casino industry. Talk about a bet. With no formal training and a love for food, he wagered his life savings on opening a restaurant. You left a really good job to do this. Very much, yes. It's something in me telling me that, you know, win or lose is a gambler of life. Was it a gamble of passion? Yes, also. Chef Wynn is credited as one of the creators of what's become known as Viet Cajun cuisine. This is back in the refugee camp. Influenced by his family's cooking as a child in Vietnam, before he immigrated to the U.S., it's a mix of Southeast Asia and the good old American South. The Cajun part is whole boiled crawfish. The Vietnamese influence, a soupy soak of butter and garlic. These are like mini lobsters, you know? That's, that's all we do, hand pick. That's everything like this, this side. This isn't your traditional crawfish boil. For one, the secret blend of spices aren't added in until after the mud bugs are out of the water. Okay, now we put the favorite sauce in. Okay. That's garlic and that's and butter, butter. And garlic. And garlic. The imported butter. Imported okay. butter. Let me get a little bit more seasoning in there. The first one is to lightly mix it. Now, now it's through seasoning, okay. yes. Got, got it, uh, okay. I'm, I'm afraid up, up that I'm gonna... It's okay. Actually, yeah, you got your hips going in there. Okay. This is how it's supposed to be done. How is it different from a crawfish boil in my backyard? When you open it up, yeah. you will see a big chunk of meat, still crunchy, very, very crunchy. Not and soggy. never, yeah, never overcooked. So that is the big difference. It may be his signature dish, but it's only one of his creations. How do you create it? Do you just. There's, is there a family recipe? Is it trial and error? Like, what is it for you? It just, food come in my mind naturally. So when I thought of something that I like to eat, I normally think of how to put them together. Chef Wynn says he likes to experiment, putting his own stamp on dishes, like stir fry noodles, chicken wings, spiced crab claws, and a Viet Cajun lobster. His favorite dish is always his most recent creation, currently a Viet Cajun salt and pepper Dungeness crab. 
That's the chunk of meat right there. Okay. And then you suck the sauce from the outside. Mm. Get a little, a little bit of everything. Yeah, it's just a little bit salty, mm -hmm. sweet, it's, spicy. Yes, it's like a blend. Yeah. It's a blend of spices. As any crawfish enthusiast knows, there is a proper way to eat a mud bug. <laughs> I've had a fair share of the southern delicacies, but my technique needed improvement. So you hold a crawfish like this. Yeah. Right? You kind of wreck it out. Is it quick. pull and turn? Yeah, pull and turn. So that's how you suck the head. You see all the juicy and seasoning kicking in. Yeah. A little bit spicy. A little? <laughs> and a little messy. Don't wear white. Uh, Corey, Vin. Um, Vin is in the front of the house. Corey, the back of the house to help me out. Um, my wife here took care of all the paperwork and also helped to uh, prep to uh, when, when we're busy. So kind of a family business. Chef Wynn working alongside his son in the kitchen. Even his mom helps. When we work in the kitchen, we like the machine. I mean, the front run like crazy, the back is like rolling. Business sank during the pandemic like restaurants everywhere. But customers are back. The loyal Houston area crowd and a never ending flow of tourists. Some come right from the airport. Customer is like our friend and the family. They very supported. It's now been more than a decade since Trong Win made that wager to leave gambling and bet on himself. You have no regrets from leaving the casino industry? No, sometimes I look back and say, wow, back there I only wear a suit, tie, look pretty, <laughs> walk away, you know, walk around, talk to people, shake hands, sit in the night, restaurant, dining, uh, with all the VIP. But now I carry every single dish out of the table to show it to the customer. But I'm very proud of it because that's what we made. That's what I made. So I'm very proud. Summer is finally upon us, which means it's peak season to indulge in a lobster roll. Whether the crustacean is drenched in butter or Thai curry paste, there's a delicious version for everyone. Mo Rocca's on a roll. Every summer, Route 1 in Wiscasset, Maine, becomes what locals call gridlock with view. Three lobster rolls, please. As pilgrims descend to feast on Red's classic lobster roll. I'm from Mount Vernon, Illinois, and I come to Wisconsin every year just to eat at Red's. Hello, hello. George and Allison Stollard came all the way from Austin, Texas. We're at lobster camp right now, which means going and getting lobster all around Maine for a week. And of course, for your onion rings ketchup, I also have an in-house blue cheese sauce. If you'd like oh, to yes, yes, yes. Debbie Gagnon's father, Al Red Gagnon, bought the shack 40 years ago. Red's secret recipe? There's no secret. Give people the freshest food and pile it high. I'm just going to grab a little more for this one. No, they don't hold back at Red's. Enjoy, honey. Here it is, right here. Each roll is stuffed with the meat of a whole lobster. So buttery and delicious. Oh, my gosh. Lobster, a once reviled seafood fed to prisoners, long ago clawed its way up from bottom feeder status on the menu. The first person to serve lobster in a sandwich may have been Harry Perry of Milford, Connecticut, who grilled one up in 1929. And it became the hallmark of our restaurant. Wendy Weir is Harry Perry's granddaughter. So we were known as the home of the famous lobster roll. Lobster rolls across Connecticut have been served hot ever since. The best. Today, the crustacean sensation is sweeping the nation. Then we create a Thai curry paste. Way over on the West lobster. Coast, Chef Brandon Keita's lobster roll takes on flavors from the Far East. So it has ginger, lemongrass, kaffir lime, garlic. At LA's Hinoki and the Bird. We don't have a real history of lobster rolls, so it's nice to be able to have freedom with creativity. And smack dab in the middle of the country, at Josh Toma's Smack Shack in Minneapolis, lobster rolls served cold are hot, don't you know? We go through about 2,000 pounds of lobster a week in the, in the summertime when we're busy. A oh, we ton of lobster yeah. a week. <laughs> Literally a ton of lobster a week. The bread's local. This is probably about a four pound. The lobster's flown in from Maine. People say, how far is the ocean from here? Well, the ocean is, you know, an hour and a half away. 
by like the Concorde. Well, by, you know. By the space shuttle. <laughs> uh, it's like two hours, okay, all right, all right. But a really ambitious lobster could make it here. If it went through the Atlantic, through the St. Lawrence Seaway. <laughs> Over millions of years, get here. When Toma first sold his roll out of a food truck seven years ago, Minnesotans were confused. I think oftentimes people would come up to the truck and think they were getting sushi. But soon enough, they took to it. So no pressure, but let's watch you take your first bite ever. <laughs> like a lobster to melted butter. Oh, oh, that's a small bite. She took a small bite. OK, wait, wait, wait. Deliver your verdict when you're ready. Enjoy it. Savor, savor. Mm. <laughs> what do you think? Very good. And another lobster roll lover is born. Thank you for not saying it tastes like chicken. <laughs> After the break, a restaurant committed to using indigenous ingredients. This is The Dish. Originally from Cleveland, Ohio, chef Steve Phelps moved to Florida 20 years ago, and he opened his popular restaurant, Indigenous. Since then, he's been a James Beard semifinalist for Best Chef in America twice for his inventive seafood dishes. Jeff Glor was lucky enough to get a reservation. So this is the Pompano Nigiri. Ready for this one, Jeff? Oh my goodness. So we've got sweet soy, we've got a Szechuan chili oil, and then there's a yuzu gastrique, which is a Japanese citrus that's really, really bright. And you got the sea purslane on top with some furikake with sesame seeds and nori. So just get it all in that's your mouth work, there, That's a Jim. work of art right here. Mmm. Wow. The impeccable balance that Steve Phelps brings to his food is something he's been cultivating since he was a teenager, but really took off about 20 years ago when he and his wife left their home outside Cleveland for what they thought was going to be a short trip to Florida. I think we spent an afternoon that day at the beach and saw a dolphin jump up in front of us and were <laughs> enlightened, said, wow, this is pretty nice. Fast forward almost 20 years later and I'm sitting with you outside my restaurant now. Indigenous was opened in 2011 in a residential neighborhood in Sarasota, which has long had a thriving arts community. Phelps set out to create a seafood oasis. The word indigenous, when people think Florida, they think citrus, and citrus is not indigenous to Florida. Correct. Indigenous ingredients here, you know, for Florida really were the rice and the corn and things like that. And, and it's tough because there's a lot of confusion with that. And I have to say it as a chef because I get a lot of calls and they go, do you make Native American dishes all day there? But indigenous to us means that it is from the area or native to the area, and that's what we do with all the food that we can. How do you describe your food philosophy? My food is food that's recognizable, and I think responsible is a name that we like to use. One example, his support of local farm-raised fish, which haven't always had the best reputation. That is changing fast as conditions inside aquaculture farms improve dramatically and as the global demand for seafood has doubled in the last 60 years. I'm so fascinated by the technology that they do. Uh, these recirculating tanks that they use, these fish never stay in the same water. The feeds have come so far advanced in technology with what they're utilizing in those two. We've got so many different species and I, I rely on them as a restaurant owner because my menus have to continuously have an item on there. Do you think fish farming is the future? It is. I'm afraid of what's happening out on our waters. The pollution in the water, the quotas for the fishermen, they're all starting to get, pollution's getting higher, quotas getting smaller, and we're gonna need that protein. From a relatively small kitchen, Phelps turns out an incredible variety. From all that seafood, to these ridiculously good beignets. Here you go, Jeff. Try one of those bad boys. Oh my lord. Whoa. <laughs> and there's more. We'll let him do the honors on the larger spread he prepared. We've got some Cobia hot dogs with a little local sauerkraut and some Cleveland Burtman's mustard. We spice it with some pastrami spices, a little baked shrimp and scallops with Everglades butter. This is barrel fish over a bacon potato latke with a uh, little yuzu hollandaise and jerk relish, our house pickles. This is redfish over Congaree and Penn uh, Midlands with a little Nashville hot butter. 
and a little hot drizzle. Those are our beignets we discussed. Uh, this is a green curry fish dip that we do here and a little bit of sesame nori crackers. Our tribute to strawberry shortcake is that panna cotta with some Florida strawberries and some sweetened biscuit crumble. We had that nigiri with the pompano earlier. A little Thai crispy pork belly with fish sauce and Thai fish sauce caramel and a baked egg. And then that's our wild mushroom bisque, which is a big staple here. We've made that for years. A couple cold brews from Calusa, our local brewery. And then, of course, I have to have Buckeyes on my menu, being an Ohio State boy. And so we've got a little raspberry jam and some banana cashew crunch underneath those. Now, I work with a Michigan fan. <laughs> no. I'm, I'm a little worried about how that's going to go over, but it looks delicious to well, me. We've had quite a few Michigan people in here say that they really enjoyed it. If Phelps can convince his arch enemies to eat and love his food, there may be no limits on what he can shoot for. Buckeyes and beer, that's a thing, right? It is today. Shall we toast to the beer and eat a Buckeye? Cheers. Though for him, it's always going to be bigger than just what's on the plate. 16 salmon after the board. 16 hurts, yeah. We got 15. You say that Education is just as important as the actual food that you're serving here. What's the most important message that you want to get across? Making your, your dining experience and your choices good for the planet. I think that's one thing that we've always put emphasis on here. People ask a lot of questions in our restaurant, and, I, and I'm lucky enough to have a staff that wants to educate a guest as well as I do. And our wild fish tonight, Red Snapper from Madeira Beach, caught off a boat called the Fish Busters. And if you know that a chef is educated and a staff is educated and can teach you about where things come from, why we utilize it, and it's good for your body and the planet. That means we just did our job today. For more stories like these and live coverage of breaking news 24 seven, stream us right here on CBS News. I'm Michelle Miller. We'll see you next time for another helping of the dish.